first episode of You Don't Have to Be a Mortician, which may seem weird coming from me, a mortician. But the reason I say that is so many of you want to have death positive careers or help reform the funeral industry, and you think that being a mortician and going to mortuary school is the only way to do it. And it's not, as evidenced by one Elua Arthur of Going With Grace, both an end of life planner, death doula, attorney, all of these cool things that have melded into a wildly death positive career. And we're gonna talk about how you do it and you're gonna show me how you do it. Great. So end of life planner, what does that mean? That means that I help people prepare to die and plan very thoroughly all the things they need to get done before their lives are over. So many people show up at the funeral home with none of that done and that's not a chill way to die. Not chill. Ideally, I like to work with people when they're still healthy so that there's no stress and they can be kind of clear about the things that they might want. Because when somebody has a terminal illness or they know that death is coming, emotions are running high, there's so much to get done. They really just want to be taking it easy and enjoying a last whiskey. What's the difference between an end of life planner and a death doula? Death doulas do all the non-medical care and support of the dying person and the family through the dying process. I think what most people don't know is that if you're a death doula versus a funeral director, a death doula is actually with the family and the dying person a lot more than if you're like, by the time I get a body, it's a corpse, it's a body. Yep. As opposed to a doula who would probably know them before they died and would be much more intimately involved in the process. Yeah, I don't do the bodies too much. I mean, I'll wash a body and keep it at home, but otherwise I do prefer them when they're still living. I'll take them when they're dead. <laughs> when you come into people's homes to help plan their death process, do they know you're also a lawyer? Most of the time they don't, and most of the time they don't find out. Really? But how, that must affect the way that you look at things and the way you do your business. I think it helps in that I can see all the practical things like very, very clearly. One big thing we learn in law school is called issue spotting, where you can look at a problem holistically and find all the gaps and the holes. And so in doing this work, I can see all the things that might need to get handled beforehand to make sure that it's all nice and clean afterward. Oh, that's so, that's like a precious, a precious skill in end of life planning. It's like gold. So today we're gonna pretend that you have come to my house and I am still healthy, I think, but we're going to go through my end of life plan. You have a really amazing booklet that I took a look at and is quite beautiful. What we do is we go through the entire thing. It's separated into nine parts to have a complete picture of all the stuff it's gonna take to handle your affairs after your life is over. And also give you a lot of things to think about about how you want your last days to go. So your healthcare agent, your healthcare decision maker, is the person who's going to make all your decisions for you in the event that you can no longer. Either you're incapacitated or you just can't anymore. This person is gonna decide on your behalf. So it's really important to pick somebody who would make decisions the way that you would. Sometimes, silly, I say, well, who's the person you trust to walk into Chipotle and come out with your order correct? How much control does someone have over life support and those kind of decisions at the end of life? Well, if you're incapacitated, not very many, but hopefully you pick somebody who's a really good decision maker who knows what you want. So right, you're a Chipotle be, person. You're a Chipotle, so they know exactly what you would do in that situation. Body and services. I love how you have burial, cremation, green burial, donation for research, home wake, death midwifery. So this is where you could potentially talk to someone if they wanted to also bring you on for the doula process Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So what would you say to someone who maybe is on hospice, probably gonna die at home and considering having a doula, what would be the benefit to them? The benefit is having somebody there who can create the dying experience that they actually would prefer. It's really similar in that way to a birth doula, right? Someone to advocate for you at this really traumatic time where you might be dealing with medical professionals and all of these other folks swimming around you and you just want someone who's completely 100% on your side Absolutely. of what you want. Absolutely, somebody to empower you, the family, in doing it the way that you really want to do it. Would you be my doula? Yes! Email accounts and passwords, I'm sure people now are talking about that much more than they used to. I think they are. So what kind of reactions do you get from people when you come into their homes and you do this work with them? I think a lot of people think it's going to be difficult. It seems really daunting when people start thinking big picture, like I need to get all my life plans down. But it's a simple process. Um, I know all the questions, and so you don't have to think about what you might say, because I'm going to ask plenty of questions in order to give people some ideas to think about, and then it's done. So the exercise we're going to do today comes from part three, comfort and care, which is creating my ideal deathbed. Yeah. 
and I filmed my bed a little earlier and it was just looking like a sloppy rolled out of bed but it's really true and you don't think about this if I was in hospice and my organs were failing and I'm in my final days do I want it to look like a sloppy hospital bed or do I want it to have flowers and candles and be a really nice place for my family to come visit and be with me. So if you were on your deathbed, what would it look like? Um, I think it would definitely be flowers, nice sounds, people that I love around me. Definitely I love candles and lighting. That's really important to me. Um, but I also, I, when I think of a doula, and maybe this is my own perception, but I think of Tibetan singing bowls and essential oils, and I'm not a very spiritual person, but that all still sounds really beautiful to me. Whatever it is that feels good, we definitely want to do for you. And it doesn't have to be tied necessarily to any spiritual practice or religion, but rather just whatever is going to make you feel most comfortable so, at the end of your life. Yeah, so you as my doula, me on my deathbed, you would maybe try some things and say, do you like this? Is this comforting for you? Well, we probably would have talked about it a lot beforehand. Like if you could choose your final moments, what would they look like? Well, I'm a really aesthetic person. So surrounded by love, but also surrounded by pretty things. Yeah. Do you like essential oil, sage? I... Do you want a singing bowl and <laughs> frankincense? I would say for this exercise, let's, let's try it. Let's do it let's all. See, let's see how it goes. Let's do it all. So I'd ask permission, can I touch you? Yes. Okay, great. And also constantly tell them what you're doing. Currently I'm touching your head, just so they're not jarred by any sensations anywhere on the body. Because as dying is something that probably takes a lot of attention and focus, we don't want to bring them out of whatever experience they're having at the moment. You're doing great. You're doing it right. You're safe. You're comfortable. Is there anything you need? Probably also go down to your feet. Is it okay if I touch your feet? As life generally starts to leave from the feet first, feet turn cold, hands start to turn cold, blood starts to leave the extremities. As it's much harder for the blood to get there as the heart is slowing down. So just give some feet some love as far as you're comfortable with. without you now. It's a really sweet last act of caregiving, particularly for people that have been caring for a dying loved one for a long time. And once they're dead, there's often this sense of not having anything left to do, um, a sense of lack of purpose. And this can give people the, uh, the opportunity to care for somebody that they love again one last time. But I'm not gonna close your chakras because you're still very vital. Mm. <laughs> what do you think would happen if you close my chakras? I don't know, but I don't want to find out. So I'm gonna note your forehead. So I'm gonna separate your bangs a little bit, but I will put them back. Okay. You ready? Yes. Sure? Mm -hmm. Dead Caitlin is not gonna care. Mm. But we should write this in your directive. I can't imagine a time where I don't care about my bangs. You need sit around, I'd exit the room plenty to give people some time with you, people that want to say any last things, or just spend some time before you do what's coming next. Thank you, Elua Arthur, end of life planner and death doula and lawyer for showing us that you do not have to be a mortician. Thank you, Caitlin. Where can we find you? on Instagram at going underscore with underscore grace uh, or on Facebook or on the website www.goingwithgrace.com. Her Instagram is great, by the way. This video was made with generous donations from death enthusiasts just like you. That, I think you just closed her chakra. <laughs>